Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, uh, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be posted on our website for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, if you are not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for Nebraska libraries, um, and that is for all types of libraries in the state. So we um, provide training, consulting, and um, help to libraries to and librarians to do their jobs. And because we serve all types of libraries, you'll kind of find shows on uh, Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, K-12, academic, um, corrections, museums, archives, uh, it just runs the gamut. Pretty much our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries of any type. Um, something um, cool we think they could be doing, uh, services and programs we, or pro, or, and resources we think they could use. We have book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos, um, all sorts of things. Uh, we bring in guest speakers from um, around the state and around the country sometimes, and sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations for us. And that's what we have this morning. Uh, joining us today is Amanda Sweet. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. And she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And she's going to share some awesome high tech makerspace goodness. Very green. I, I love this slide, especially since we've just trying to come out of winter. <laughs> and Slowly but surely. Are not so green yet. So this is very nice to see today. <laughs> it's a look into the future. Yeah. <laughs> So um, go ahead and take it away, Amanda. Cool. So this is a quad capture drone, and it has a webcam mount. And what it's doing right now is spraying. It can spray nutrients. It can spray um, weed killer, bug killer, and it can also measure plant health based on photograph imaging. Oh, nice. So. I know, shiny. So the, next, the next level of the crop duster planes that used to go across. Exactly. And you can also network these together in like a little swarm. So they oh. can cover entire fields and talk to each other. And one drone will say, yeah, I covered this section. And the other one will be going like, I'm over here. Don't come over here. We don't want to crash into each other. <laughs> and it'll just cover the whole thing. Nice. So they're kind of awesome. So in this session, we're going to talk about the different technology that's available and how libraries might be able to introduce this tech to their communities. And this can be done in public library, academic library, just whatever your flavor is, give it a try. All right, so what we're, what we're pretty much going to go over is librarians can't and will not know everything about the technology that's available. So we're going to cover what libraries actually need to know to be able to get the most out of introducing technology to people and helping to figure out what different things people in the community actually want to achieve so that you connect people to the right technology and how to understand this kind of walks hand in hand, which is different ways to help people figure out and articulate their needs, which is sometimes easier than done, and how to navigate the different resources and infra like network of information that I've put together, and it's basically curated resources from different people I've talked to, websites I've been to, and recommended resources. And these will be kind of a preview of what's available for you to use to get you kind of quick started into your own programs. So let's start off with what do you actually need to know? So as a librarian, it'll help to know there's going to be a lot of technology that is available to everyone in the world, 
but what's available to you immediately is what you can fundraise for and what you might be able to check out using tickets for mail through the Nebraska Library Commission. So let me go to this main website here. So on this site, you have information about the high tech, which we'll get to a little later. But what I'll preview now is the tech kits through the mail. So you know we just saw that drone, that quad capture that's doing amazing things with fields. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be able to introduce libraries to this technology, this is a lower cost drone that has the webcam capability and communicates to via remote and can be connected in through an app on a phone. It uses the same functionality and features as that quad capter, but it's not as expensive and it will, it's available to you. You can check it out as soon as COVID actually lets me check things out to people again and you'll be able to start using it. And the trick is to be able to frame this introduction point into the larger context of that drone and being able to connect it into people that are trying to solve the problems that can be solved with that drone. So what I found the best way to do is you don't have to understand the technology fully right away, but you need to understand the people and the problems they're facing. Because if you know that people are try are starting to face problems with they have a reduced staff on the farm, but they still need to be able to get nutrients out into the field. And it's also, you have an aging farmer who is not able to get out into the field quite as often or are, isn't able to recruit new help because the they're not bringing in the wages. This drone would be a good possible solution for that to be able to deliver those nutrients. And the drone is, this is an introductory point that says, well, if you've never used a drone before, you can learn the basics of it here in the library. You can start learning it and contextualizing it in the way that you need it to. You'll start prototyping different ideas and sketching things out just on a sheet of paper. And you'll start learning how to talk to the right people to figure out if this is the right thing for you. And because you were able to use this hands-on in the library, you can now extend this solution out into other areas. So that's kind of an example of how it has been used in the library in the past and how it could be used in your library in the future. And so that mapping out the problems is probably one of the biggest things that you can do to start using this. So how can you map out problems? Um, there are a variety of different ways, actually. So one of the biggest ones is just um, a, a community conversation. You can start bringing in different demographics and different groups and just start asking people. Some people can already clearly articulate the problems that they're facing right now, and others haven't really thought it through and haven't really thought of that they could actually be part of the solution to what they're facing. So one good way is to actually start broadening out um, the buckets that people are looking into, which is, so a lot of you may have already seen this before, it's the sustainable development goals. This is a lot, but I just use this as a lens to look at the problems with the within a community as a starting point. And I say, so in the case of the drones, that's the life on land. And that is trying to build out the, what are people going to eat? And how are you going to cultivate the land so that people can eat? And how are you going to, Lincoln actually has really clean air, so that's not always the greatest example. But there is, there are some well water issues that are across the state of Nebraska that um, internet things like Internet of Things might be able to fix. But understanding that problem and being able to direct your energy toward that location is one of the biggest things you can do. And even as a librarian, if that is the only step that you take, cool, I'm okay with that. And 
So once you've mapped out these different problems, you want to help connect people with a problem-solving methodology. And the most popular one is probably design thinking from Stanford. Um, Stanford didn't create it, they popularized it, but they were really good at popularizing it. So I usually recommend Stanford as the place to go to learn design thinking and problem solving. And another place to go is the user experience research. Um, let me go to their website. <clears throat> So the Interaction Design Foundation will also give you different ways to kind of vet out different problems people are facing and how to help people with the problem solving process. So if you are trying to find new and different ways to understand what people are facing and how you can help, the Interaction Design Foundation with the user experience research is the place to be. And you can also start building out personas. So a persona is basically characterizing the different problems people are facing and what is most important to them and how people are basically running through life. So these are some of the user experience and different tools that I've used. So this is a customer journey map, and this is how people are going to approach your library services, what they're thinking about when they first see it, how they first see it, the factors that go into whether or not they're going to use your library service, what made them actually attend, and what's going to make people come back. And down on the side here is where you're going to put in people's motivation for doing this. And this is how you're going to improve your, one, it'll improve library services overall, but it'll also help improve how you're introducing people to different technologies. You're going to be experimenting with different makerspace activities and you'll have access to a bunch of them that you can try. But if you wanna find out if it's effective and if people are finding you effectively, then this process is just kind of a good exercise to start going through because it's going to help you just dig deeper into that to find out if what you're doing is working and why, and how you can dig into. And you can also run through day in the life activities that will kind of run through what people are actually facing on a day-to-day -day basis, find out what people, what's important to people the problems that they're facing, how they're feeling during that point, the different people that they're interacting with, how they might be asking for help and where they might be, their network of people, and what is their biggest, like the biggest concerns, problems, and the different tools that they might be using or that they could use during that stage. So if you're trying to understand the people, the problems people are facing, their day-to-day -day activities and why technology might matter to them, just going through this exercise for different demographics and different specific like one-time events like job searches or trying to figure out different, uh, different specific tasks and tools within an industry or within a task that someone might do during work or at home. This will help you just drill down and just dig deeper into who, what, where, and why all this matters. And I really like the, this, the, um, the customer, the journey map too, that you were doing it. As I was looking at it, I was thinking, I know we're talking about technology and makerspace goodness and whatnot today, but yeah. it could be used for anything in your library, any services or programs you're doing. I know a lot of libraries are <clears throat> always trying to figure out this kind of thing about everything is it working is what i'm doing is this version of story time correct um mm -hmm. trying to do community needs assessments and figuring out how do i figure out what they need <laughs> yeah. um, and so this can be used across anything i think that libraries do not just um digital or technology related things yeah and i've process. used this I've used this for planning out, helping libraries plan out makerspaces, and I've used it for 
I'm using it in an upcoming um, digital skills like teaching technology in the library class that I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. Right now it's a workshop, but eventually it'll be a class. <laughs> and so in this document, I've got like the blank sheet and then I've got the um, a, sample, a sample sheet in here. And then I've got a sample sheet, a day in the life and a clickable fillable sheet and a blank printable. And this is the customer persona that I was talking about before. So after you've gone through a day in the life and you've started thinking about what people are facing and why, you can summarize it in based on demographic, what people are like a general description of the demographic that you're talking about, what they're trying to get out of life, what's standing in their way, the motivation, this motivation section can also come in handy for marketing, for when you're trying to get people into a makerspace or activity, and when you're trying to figure out who, what, where, and why they're trying to do the things they want to do. And the influences would be the other people and organizations, network, individuals, friends, families that might be helping them with their life goals or overcome barriers. And this is where you're going to start brainstorming the technology tools that they can possibly use. So as you start understanding the technology that's available, you can start putting it in here as a, recommend, as a recommended activity offering or library service offering, or even just an information resource offering that you can connect people with who are trying to overcome these barriers. And I know that I'm talking about high tech in here, which would be drones, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and that's really cool and awesome and shiny, but there's more to the technology world than just that. So they could also be just be using social media, they could be using Microsoft Word, Excel, they might be trying to find job search resources or just trying to upskill so that they can future-proof their workforce. And this is just kind of a tool that you can use for all of that. So it doesn't always have to be just for high tech, it can be for anything. And this is your, again, your clickable if you happen to use Canva and your example of what this could look like. And I will actually share this out if you wanna be able to access this later and I'll just make it as a viewable and put that into the chat. And, and I'll, yeah, so you guys can grab that link which we get in the chat and the questions there. Um, and I'll also say, we'll, I'll make sure I add a link to it when we put up the, um, the recording, the archive. We always do, um, there we go. Um, a link to Amanda's slides will be included with that, <coughs> the Google slides, <coughs> and a link to this specific Canva uh, resource. And, and I'll also have any questions or anything throughout um, the show. I didn't mention at the beginning, but some of you already know. Uh, go ahead and type in your question section, and um, I can grab them from there for Amanda to answer any of your questions. You have about anything? And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go to the design thinking resources that I use. And so there, so this resource out of Stanford, they have options for specifically for K through 12, they have options for pretty much every age range and age group and everything. So you can just kind of take, give this a gander, go up to their resources and programs, and you can start learning about design thinking and how that can work for you. I did a, I'm pretty sure I did an Encompass on design thinking before, but I, can't remember when. I can find out. I'll go look it up while you're. And I'll put that D school resource in the chat and it should be on there now. And so that one also has lesson plan ideas and will walk you through um, the entire process. So you don't need me to give you the lesson plan. They've already done it. All right, so once you figure it out. There it is, I found it. 
there, I type, I, I went into our search, and I'll show you this, you guys this later in our archives, you can search through all of them. And I typed in design thinking, got a lot of results, but eventually find the one, yeah, um, November, 2019, uh, design thinking, how technology is made. Oh yeah. It's all coming back to me now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So once you've started to understand the problems that people are facing and how you can help people figure out how to solve those problems and maybe do a design thinking activity in the library, then you can start thinking about well, what are the organizations that are already using these technology tools and how can those how can we partner with those organizations to mm -hmm. start introducing people to this technology and now is a good time to start digging into the technology that's actually available there is not a big point in looking at a lot of this technology until you know what people are trying to do and why because so there's this whole big thing about People are, libraries and schools are trying to introduce people to new technology tools, and there's a lot of awesome work going on about it. But then the, the kind of the gap that comes in is you go through an entire curriculum of maybe a week or even a month of hour of code. You get all these awesome activities, people are hyped up, they're ready to go. Then they start asking why. And they say, we just started learning how to do web design. We learned the basics of robotics. What does it matter? And how is this relevant to me? And when you, if you can't answer or connect people with the resources that say why this tool matters and how it can be relevant to you, it's not gonna launch a learning journey. It's not gonna launch a, I need to know how to do this to live. I need to know how to do this to achieve the things I want to achieve. So taking that first step of figuring out what people want to achieve and helping people articulate what they actually need, opening up those conversations and figuring all that out first will help you when you're trying to introduce this tech. Because you might find out half of it you don't need, half of it you might need later, and the other half of it you can need right away. So it'll help you prioritize what you need, when, where, and why. And it'll help you choose, I need this drone because I'm going to be targeting the local farmers who are trying to find new and different ways to distribute nutrients into the soil. Or they need new and different ways to, to monitor plant health so that they don't have to use manpower to go through the fields every single day. And you might want to use a robot if you're going to be going into a potentially unsafe area. So if you have an area that's struck with a lot of natural disasters or if there's a lot of flood, there's issues with flooding and you know that you're going to have recurring issues when you don't want to send a human into dangerous areas, then you might want to start building a local resource of robotics so that you can start sending the robot into those to excavate that potentially dangerous area instead of sending humans. And you can even start networking different locations together to start sharing a potentially expensive robot. But their first introduction into robotics can be Q. Because Q works with the same kind of app controlled device or remote controlled device that would help you learn how to control this robot through an uncontrolled space. So when we open up Q here and we go to learn more, I've got a librarian preparation guide for all of these materials that will help librarians learn the ba very basics of what they need to know to be able to use this specific device. You can introduce people to robotics using this device and give the example of a, an excavating robot, even if you don't know how to program an excavating robot. After going through this system, you'll understand how and why it would be important. And you can just see from the table of contents kind of what you would actually learn during this. I have similar categories in pretty much every librarian preparation guide so that you can use this to have that assurance that you are 
ready and raring to go and the, you know what you need to know to be able to lead an activity. And then you can go from there. I built an introductory lesson plan that uses some of the examples that I talk about. So this introductory lesson plan will actually take people through navigating the radioactive disaster. So you can see here, you would set up your radioactive disaster. It gives you what you would want to set up on the different days, how you can set up different little obstacle courses that people can navigate through. And if you want to be able to customize this instead of a radioactive disaster, it can be a flood or it can be, or you can just set it up for a radioactive disaster and then say, this is for any potential disaster and start citing different things that you faced in the past and how you might be able to use this type of technology in the future. Or if it's Halloween, just make it a zombie, who knows? So using this kind of thing, it's kind of your early introduction and kind of ease the, eases the pathway for libraries to start using these materials. And let me go back in here. And I'll go back into my kits here. So each one of these different sections, along with the library and preparation guide and the, um, the lesson plan, there's also an extra set of activities and resources that are already pre-made if you're looking for the grab and go option. And each one of these links over to just a mess of different options that already has pre-made stuff. If you're looking for different ways to contextualize robots into your community, there's also a collection of real world problems that are that's using these robotics and these different tools. And it'll also start telling you how these different tools start to overlap with each other. Like artificial intelligence, robotics, and Internet of Things, they just kind of go together. And if you start exploring this site and start exploring the different options of what this can do, you'll kind of start to see how this technology gets braided together and how it can be used in different ways and different combinations. And so these are the kits themselves. And the kits are paired with uh, high-tech information resources. So from the tech kit, we started with the Q robot. Then you can go over to the high-tech section, go to robotics, and you can dig more into how you can contextualize this robot to what people are trying to do and why. So we saw some of this in the robotics section, but this also digs a little bit deeper for people who want more information and who might wanna be able to start using this for themselves, whether they are a high school student and trying to figure out what they wanna do in real life, or if they are a small business owner and they want to figure out how they can leverage technology to improve their business. These are, this is kind of how people can figure out why this technology matters and how it can be applied to local community. And this is also kind of, um, I chose mostly beginner level resources just to give a kind of an introductory overview, but I also chose a mess of extended resources so that the people who want to dig deeper into what all this stuff is can. And it'll give just a mess of different real world solutions. I chose some um, Nebraska Midwest specific examples just because this is shameless, but it got more clicks. So that's basically why I did it. And I've also chosen some additional resources that will basically give a collection from different organizations around the world that shows how this stuff is used. And one of the biggest questions that I also get about technology is, well, this is all really cool, awesome, and shiny, but what could possibly go wrong and what can, do, what can we do about it if we're gonna be actually creating some of this stuff for ourselves? So this kind of, this section will answer that question about what are people worried about right now with technology and society and how can we not contribute to that problem? 
and what should we worry be what should we be worried about so that we don't do the same thing with the same technology in our community what should we know about and if a small business or a high school student wants to learn how this stuff is made i've also dug into the different teams that are within organizations or teams just in general that are required to make this stuff and i've gone into the design process and the so there's some stuff about the overall design process we've got the um, engineering we've got um, how businesses would actually adopt this into what they're doing we've gotten some different challenges that can come up while you're trying to use this technology and if you're really fascinated with this tech and you want to incorporate it into your own business what are you going to run into and again the same methodology can be used for pretty much any technology whether it's a robot or social media you're going to run into the same kind of process of you need to in, you need to figure out how this technology can you can be used you'll figure out um, whether you're going to be able to get buy-in for being able to use this technology then you'll figure out how to incorporate it into your organization and how to spread it out and get it to be adopted and then you're going to run into challenges of people going i don't want to use a robot and people saying i can't learn how to use a robot and trying to kind of overcome that when you know that this is the solution that would actually be best for that you'd be surprised what you can learn and teach <laughs> exactly <laughs> And there are other, so there are the tech kits, but then there's also alternatives to being able to try this tech in the library in other ways. So a lot of high schools across the state of Nebraska right now are using VEX Robotics. So if your community already has VEX Robotics, this might be kind of a good launch in to being able to introduce robotics to other parts of the community. And there's also the Make Wonder robots. Um, Q dash and dot are all Q dash and dot are all from the Make Wonder family. That's the little robot dude here. And let me go back in here. And there's also websites like edX and Coursera. So if people want to start learning how to use this in their own small business or a larger organization. They can go to edX and Coursera, search for robotics, and there's different courses to show them how to incorporate it into their existing business model or how to um, learn it. You can learn how to develop it. You can learn how to um, incorporate it. Like as a manager, you can learn how to incorporate it into your small business. You can learn how to adjust the culture of your company to start accounting for new technology. And you can just learn a mess of stuff on edX and Coursera. A lot of it you can audit for free, or if you need to be able to prove that you did it, you can also upgrade to a certificate. And there's also the Raspberry Pi, which is if people want to get into the development side of things. And the ultimate guide for learning robotics at home from Robot Shop will teach you pretty much everything you need to know to be able to develop and design your own robots. And last but not least, there's also the different learning communities that you can route people over to so that they can actually interact with other people who are trying to learn this stuff. So if you find someone who's like, I really need to learn about robots and I can't stop now, but you know that your library is not and your community doesn't have the local resources to be able to help them, you can send them to these online learning communities. But before you send them to these learning communities, check the local and state resources to make sure there's not something that's in the local hub that you might be able to use. I, ga I prioritize gathering the online learning communities just because I found out a lot of the communities I talked to didn't already have a local resource for this. So that's why I put it together that way. But start local. And note to self, I need to add a back to high tech homepage here, but that's like three lines of code. I'll live. 
All right, so that was the robotics example. And I will give you one more example just for the sake of doing it. And I will do artificial intelligence and Internet of Things that kind of walk hand in hand. So I will do AI because why not? So this is just to show that each one of these pages will kind of give you really similar information. And artificial intelligence is probably one of the things that intimidates people the most. But this reading through this page will take that intimidation away because it'll tell you just a general idea of what it actually is. AI is a branch of computer science that allows computers to make predictions and decisions to solve problems. And then watching this video will show you different examples of how this works. Because right now, artificial intelligence is trying to replicate human senses using robotic sensors. So how we touch a surface and figure out that it's a certain texture or how we look at pictures and figure and being and be able to identify what they are and categorize it into different buckets and then try to recognize patterns and create meanings uh, create meaning out of what that image is they're trying to train artificial intelligence to be able to do that they're doing that using massive quantities of training sets so they use a million different examples Maybe not a million, that's an exaggeration. Most training sets might not be that big. But they use these examples to help the computer system learn patterns, and then they start giving different factors and variables to help the computer interpret the different patterns into real world representations. And probably the best way to learn what that actually means, watch the video. And you can also watch these videos down here and find the actual real world solutions to see this in action. Because the definition means right. nothing. <laughs> these are the kind of things you need to see. Like it, it clicks sometimes with me, especially once I see something done actually happening. I'm like, oh, that makes sense now. And then you can share yeah. that with other people, yeah. So one that I'll use is the most common example, just because the definition I gave is generic. Um, cucumbers, machine learning. And I'll go to the video here. So that's pretty much the long and the short of how machine learning works. It's basically just, it covers one small task within a larger set of tasks that a person has to do. It took pictures of the cucumbers and sorted them into bins using a robotic conveyor belt and a set of sensors and said, if this cucumber is curved this way, pop it into this bin. If it's straight, pop it into this bin. And it just, recognizing those patterns and doing what you tell it to do. So when you want to try to introduce people to the idea 
of machine learning and artificial intelligence in the library. I have too many tabs open, so I'm just going to go back here. So you can gain a basic understanding of what artificial intelligence is yourself first, just by reading through a few of the resources on this site and starting to look at some of the different examples of how it's used. Once you can gain a basic understanding of how that actually works, you can start helping people make the connection between artificial intelligence and what it means for you. And right now, this is one of the fastest growing technologies in the world, and mm -hmm. it's kind of already everywhere. So the people that are going to be able to tackle this technology and be able to leverage and use it for themselves are the ones who are going to thrive the most. And they are making it easier and easier and easier to be able to use this technology. So we'll just skip over into how it's made. So these are a mess of different resources that show the different steps to how machine learning actually happens. It goes into the different teams that make machine learning work most effectively. So if you find a use for machine learning, basically the litmus test for finding a use for machine learning is, do I have to be able to recognize a lot of different patterns to be able to do what I need to do? Um, do I need a lot of manpower to be able to do it? Is it a somewhat easy task? And basically, can it be automated without horrible things happening? And so something like the cucumber example of just basically take a picture, sort it in a bin, that's what they use in manufacturing a lot of the times and what is already being used in pretty much warehouses everywhere. And if you are, are in manufacturing or if you want to go into production or if you want to go into, if you want to start working for Amazon or start doing supply chain management, machine learning is everywhere. And, but if you want to go into social sciences, that's what could go wrong. So if you start trying to apply artificial intelligence to human problems and different subjective problems that could have different answers based on who you ask, that's where it could get into a problem. And so, and you can also get into human bias, which is human bias isn't new. I mean, we've gotten it in news and media, we've gotten it in social media, we've gotten it pretty much everywhere. But this is going to tell you that as people are using, as people are learning this new and fancy technology, this is what could go wrong, especially the deep fakes, because you can now fake a video and make it look like someone said something that they never actually said. And it only takes 152 lines of code. I tried it; it was scary. And you can also That's way too easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they also make a drag a drag and drop um, system, so that you can go online, find pictures of Nicolas Cage, drag and drop them into the program. It uses that as the training set, and then if you get the pictures and videos from different angles, it'll start replicating it. And you can also replicate the voice using different audio samples from different Nick Cage videos. So if you have a popular figure that has enough stuff online and has enough video voice clips online, you can replicate it. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing a media literacy thing in the library, it might be a good thing to add in there. So if you do want to try machine learning in the library, there are both easy and difficult ways to do this, and there are different organizations that you can partner up with that will do the instruction for you, or that will have online, like all online platforms for the instruction. So if you are affiliated with a high school or a university, the AI for All is an awesome one, because they do have a curriculum and some different activities that they can put your, your students through that will help introduce them and figure out the problem solving system. So if you don't want to do all this mess of stuff I was just talking about, 
in here, they will do it for you and they will do it for AI. And there's also Google's Creative Lab, which has a set of AI experiments that are basically just step-by-step -step experiments that people can use to as a hands-on way of figuring out how this stuff all works. The hard part was already done by Google, and they will just kind of walk you through different exercises and activities that is basically lesson plan format so that you can figure out how this stuff works. And there's also a, this one's kind of a fun one, the Teachable Machine. It uses, it takes the image of your hand and kind of recognizes gestures and stuff. And you can also now do this with Scratch. So Scratch oh. is the drag and drop coding and there is an AI option for it. And it's the Machine Learning for Kids. So just kind of a quick three-step thing that will help you collect the examples. This is examples and images collected from the internet. You just drag and drop the, the image into the little bucket where they tell you to drop it. And the, the machine learning system is already pre-programmed into, into the thing. You don't have to do, to do anything to code it. It's already there. And you can categorize images. You can you can do a mess of stuff. Um, there is a bunch of activities up here. Um, I've done the make me happy one. I did the car or cup. I did Titanic and Shy Panda. So they're just kind of fun to do and they teach you a lot about how this stuff works. So if you already use Scratch, or if that's something that you're thinking about adopting in your library, this is just kind of a fun thing to add in there. And if you want to start with the code.org approach to be able to show just how the stuff works, there are, set, there are a collection of resources that will help you figure out how this stuff actually works. And then, if you decide to do the first half of this session that talks about how to identify problems, that's how you can start bridging this code.org, which is an awesome resource, it's one of my favorites, into contextualizing it and making it relevant to the student and the parents that you also have to convince to say why your kids need to actually learn this stuff. Because at face value, why do you need to learn AI for oceans in the middle of Nebraska and how can it be applied to what we're doing here? And it can. Um, if you wanna be able to use machine learning to sort recycling, which is a big problem across the state, and if you wanna learn it well enough to make room recycle sorting cost-effective, then this AI for Oceans can help you learn how different the objects are categorized using a machine learning model. And then you can say, well, we throw out a significant part of portion of our plastic waste and it's never going to be um, decomposing in our landfill, it's just going to sit there and we're going to need to open a new landfill. Mm -hmm. How can we solve this problem? then this is a good way to start introducing it. And so there's just a mess of resources that are available here. So you can start exploring through what's available to you mm -hmm. in the different categories and find out how it can be applicable. Um, if you're having troubles doing this process, you can also email me, um, amanda.sweet at nebraska.gov, and I can help you kind of walk through the tech that's available and how you can customize it and tailor it to the problems facing our community. I'll basically just run you through a few exercises to start brainstorming problems and who might be interested and nice. then start syncing it up with different activities and options that you might want to try. So that's good. They can you know practice with you before trying to just go into this kind of blindly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's good to have someone help you hold you through it and say this is what will happen and now you can bring it to someone else yeah pretty much yeah and having all of these lessons and, and instructions on how to do it 
um, is great, uh, especially since you, you're, you were showing the tech kits and the things that we have here to eventually loan out, which is a great program that Amanda has set up. However, this just got going, I think, um, and really well organized last year when COVID reared its ugly head. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, I don't know if anything has been loaned out yet. No. Not a thing. I've taken it to different libraries. I've done There's demos not. and I've done like, so individual things have gone out, mm -hmm. but they haven't, they haven't had a chance to go out yet. Yeah. There's piles of boxes in Amanda's office. It's sad. They shouldn't be there. They should be out and about. But <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> yeah. as things improve, um, if things improve over this year, we'll be able to actually send these out. But having those other resources and things that are there is online. Th there's things you can still do without having the stuff from us. Yeah. Um, or use this to find out about some of these if there's something that you could. Um, potentially purchase for your own library. If you figured out this is the one thing people keep wanting to look at or that we could definitely use, you know, like the drone that you said is cheaper than the, the big fancy one on the first slide. <laughs> cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you know the, re the information is here. The test kits, you know, soon, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and you also don't have to do anything quite as complicated as that whole system that I set up. You can also just check it out, use it for a quick project, and send it back on. Mm -hmm. You have options. And I still have no idea when these will actually be able to go out. One day. Yeah, we'll have to see what the how to do it safely, depending on what's happening around the state. Yeah. Yeah. And not gonna lie, it took a minute to put this together. But yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Probably putting all these resources together took a lot longer than just like being able to put a tech a kit in a box and mail it out. That oh, I probably yeah. could have done in like ten minutes. But you need to know what to do with it once you get it if you're not yeah. 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 Just if you're new to any of these resources. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let me go back to my main presentation here and we'll cover over what else we have available here. So I've already gone over basically more or less what you would need to know to really contextualize and get the most use out of this technology. And I've gone over some different options for how you can figure out what people actually want. So I'll go over a quick example of different things that I found out people actually want to be able to do after I've, this is mostly stuff I found out through makerspace trainings and consultations and visiting different libraries. Mm -hmm. And so mostly what people want to do is they want to do a career change because they recently lost a job and they don't want to, they, don't know what else they can do in their local area with the skills and options available to them now, or they want to be able to change or improve a process in a their small business or organization, and they want to experiment with what's possible there. Um, there for the makerspaces, there have been a lot of questions about how do I start a business and what can I do with this? So mm -hmm. those are different entrepreneurship resources. And with that, and also how do I incorporate this into my volunteer and hobbies so I can just solve local problems without starting a whole pr a business. So if you want to get resources for uh, starting a business or for figuring out how to do the entrepreneurship route. There are, I gathered a bunch of resources for, these are Nebraska specific resources for being able to build a business, like write a business plan, figure out what you actually wanna do. And these are different organizations across the state that are working in entrepreneurship. 
So as a library, if you introduce people to this tech tool or if you help people identify a problem they want to solve and they want to convert it into a business, they can contact these different associations, especially these down at the bottom here, that will help walk them through the entrepreneurship process and how to start getting ideas and figuring out how it all works. And a new one that I just found out about is called Enmotion, which is kind of an idea generator. It's a startup generator that will help you walk through the, it'll help you prototype different ideas and walk you through that process to figure out which idea is viable, what people actually need, do the customer research and customer, customer journey mapping, and then figure out the resources that are available to you and how to turn an idea into an actionable business. And if you just want to learn what a, writing a business plan is all about, their score is probably one of the most popular resources. It's used in the Small Business Association and it's also used by the, I believe it's used by the, the Economic Development Department of Economic Development in Nebraska as well. And there's also some resources from Grow Nebraska. Grow Nebraska will help you do the marketing and figuring out if your plan is viable. And there's also some networking opportunities to connect with people who have already done it before. So if you yeah. learn from someone else who's already been through it. <laughs> And they have free webinars and tutorials that are available on Grow Nebraska. So they have the writing a business plan. They've got a network of resources that are available for free and low cost to budding businesses. Uh, we've got resources for how to set up a business website. So if you have a local crafter that wants to figure out the best way to set up their website, then you can do it that way. And there's also options for marketing your business. And these I am still building out, but they should be done pretty soon. Um, I can send out the link to this so you have a, what's, ava what's available immediately. And I'm adding resources to this. As I, I just talked to the, the Economic Development Department yesterday, mm -hmm. and I went to an entrepreneurship group I've been going to an entrepreneurship groups for probably about a year. So I started gathering these and figuring out the process for how businesses are started, how tech is integrated into organizations and how tech happens. <laughs> and so a lot of these were rec resources recommended by them or things that I found online. Um, Coursera and edX is always a good resource for it. Uh, if you want to know how to buy and sell things online, I curated resources for how to start an Etsy shop and how to sell things on eBay if you are selling used goods and how to shop safely online and how to set up a business so that an online business so that people would feel safe shopping on it. And again, I'm also adding more resources. And that's what's great about this. Uh being a Google Doc that you are putting out there to share to people that um, more stuff will be added. So you, you know, when you know, if you're going to use this as a resource, keep checking to see if new stuff yeah. is added, new new links are added. Um, and also remind everyone too that um, the slides, the Google slides, will be shared to you all as well. Will be included in the archive. So which if you saw the way Amanda got to this, she clicked the link from her slides and then got to that document. You'll have that same ability too from in there. And these digital skill clusters, I will put a link into the chat. So the these top sections are completed already. These I'm working on this week. And these are coming in the next month or two. Some of these I have resources for already. I just need to format them. Mm -hmm. They're basically formatted so that you can copy and paste it into your own library website. Nice. I yeah. used to have the little dot as a list, but it didn't copy and paste cleanly. And so I just took the dot off and it was fine. <laughs> cool. 
right, and it is about 11 o'clock here. Let me go back to my main slide and I will just put my contact info up here so people can ask questions. Do we have any questions that you can think of right now? Let's uh, see. All right. Yes. Anybody have any questions for Amanda um, about anything she's talked about? A lot of good resources and information here for you to use um, when you do decide to start uh, figuring out how how to teach this kind of technology in your libraries. What you're figuring out what your library, your community may need. Um, go ahead and type into the questions section. And if you are looking for a course to teach a, teach technology in the library, um, I'm doing my first workshop workshop session through Southeast Library System next month. So if you're in that system or around the state, they're accepting um, attendees from everywhere. You can sign up for that. And I'm also going to start branching into the other three library systems across Nebraska in mm -hmm. May, June, and July, because there's only so much time in a day. <laughs> yeah. Um, so to sign up for theirs, you'd uh, go to the Southeast System page, or do you know if it's, a, it's not on our calendar yet. What day is it next month? Do you know? It is April 15th. It's going out in their news, their upcoming newsletter, and Todd's also going to be sending out a registration email. So there'll be a link in the system newsletter, and it's also going to be in an email out to the systems. Okay, cool. Keep your eyes out on that. On that, yeah, yeah. Our regional library systems, they do. We do do things specifically for each of the four systems, but um, most of the things they do are not restricted to the that system you know they are they're all work together um you're allowed to cross borders <laughs> yeah. and this is this one's open to everyone it's just hosted by them right yeah so so look for that one coming up um next month and then other ones coming up um in the next few months that you can uh, attend as well um got some thank yous coming in and someone says no questions at this time but thank you for all the great information Sounds like we'll have a lot of follow-up maybe coming after as people yeah. get put out there. Yeah, which is great. That's the way it should work. You know, we'll start looking at it. Um, if you weren't sure what you were going to do, dig into the resources. And then if you do need to know more, that's what Amanda is here for. She does these presentations and workshops, but she is on call, we'll call it, for yeah. um, anything that you might need help with. As you can see, she kind of does the legwork of figuring out all the, these things for you. That's technology innovation librarian. Um, what's out there? What can be done with it? Are there lesson plans? If not creating things, um, you know, doing that hard, the, that planning work, and then you can go in and use what she has created or modify for what you need in your community and at your libraries. All right, it does not look like there's any desperate questions coming in. Not a problem. Um, it was a lot. Huh? It was, it was a lot. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> contact Amanda if you do have any. All right, I am going to pull back presenter control to my screen here. There we go. All right, so that will wrap it up for our high-tech makerspace goodness. There's a lot of goodness in there, a lot of things to do, to um, look at. Um, as I said, it will be, um, we are recording and archive will be available. It should be tomorrow, you'll get you all get an email from me, all of you who attended today and everybody who um, registered. Um, on our Encompass Live website, these are upcoming shows, but our archives are here. And um, the most recent one will be at the top of the page, link to the recording in YouTube and link to the slides. Um, and the other resources that uh, Amanda had kind of pushed out to us as well, the Canva and the, the Stanford links, we'll I'll add those in as well. Um, you can search our archives here if you want to for the whole, all the archives, just most recent 12 months. That is because this is the full archive of Encompass Live from when we started, and I will not scroll all the way down because that would be disturb disturbing. <laughs> um, January 2009 was the first show, and all of our archives are here. Um, so you can um, search for anything you want to on here. Uh, just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Uh, it, some information may end up being old. Some resources may no longer exist or may no longer work the same anymore. Uh, some of them stand the test of time. Book lists, 
um, things, but um, some things may become outdated. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date. Um, and this is where I went to search for that one. What was it? The, the uh, design the, thinking. Design thinking. Yeah, I can't remember. And I just did that and search, and as you can see, a bunch of things came up, but. I think this one we were talking about specifically, here's the one that is the, a pretty sweet text session that Amanda did back in November 2019, um, specifically about design thinking. So you can watch that one or any of the other ones here that might be of interest to you. Um, we I do, do have a Facebook page. I've got links to that as well, but here it is over here. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We post reminders about shows announcements, uh, information about presenters here. So um, like us on Facebook to keep up with that. We also push out to Twitter and Instagram. I think that's it. Um, and there's always the hashtag NCUMP Live. That's our abbreviated hashtag for the show. So you can keep an eye on what we're doing there as well. So um, that will wrap it up for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is ways to fill your shelves without draining your budget. Very important. Uh, budgets are short, are, are, are small, are even being reduced. So um, this is Laura Jones. She's from the Indiana State Library, has some great tips and tricks about how to do this. So please do sign up for that show and any of our other ones we have coming up. And you'll start seeing the April shows being posted here as well as I start confirming those. So thank you, Amanda, for being with us. This was great. Learned a lot. Too many fun things to play with. <laughs> Um, and we got some other thank yous coming in. You're welcome um, for this. And hopefully we'll see you um, attending on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>